Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us um, today for our PRC Saltillo guest webinar. I'm Heather Prenevo. I'm a Saltillo AT consultant and training and implementation team member. I'll be moderating your webinar today along with Bet Waitlift Beaver and Lisa Tim. We're excited to have Christy Davies with us today to talk about evaluating for AAC through telepractice. Evaluate via tele-AAC will help you learn about evaluating the AAC um, through virtual platforms. Next slide, we're gonna go through some housekeeping details. If you're having any trouble hearing or connecting to our webinar, um, you try logging out of GoToWebinar and coming back in. If that still doesn't work, then we will um, have you restart your computer. Otherwise, you can try contacting Log Me In, the um, developers for GoToWebinar, and see if they can troubleshoot that with you. There are training materials um, in the handouts section of the toolbar. Um, they are available during the class. There are PDFs in there that have your ASHA information, as well as um, a, the handout for today and instructions on how to turn in the ASHA. Uh, CEUs. If you have any questions, please type them into the question chat window. We will be addressing these with the presenter at the end as time allows. On the next slide, we would like, um, if you have ASHA um, registry, you will be able to submit the ASHA participation form within the next 15 days to have them register your ASHA CEUs. When you do this, please make sure you include today's date on the form and the name of the training, Evaluate for a Tele-AAC. Instructions and this form, as I mentioned, are in that handout section. You will be emailing them to info at printrom.com. And in the subject line, please again have the title of the class and the date so that they are able to put this together um, for those CEUs. If you do not use the ASHA CEU registry, you will still be getting a certificate of attendance that you can use for your PD hours. Christy Davies, her disclosure information is here. She's presenting and receiving a small stipend for today and no other relevant non-financial relationships. This course is being offered for point one ASHA CEUs. You must stay on the um, webinar for the entire time it is time stamped. And with that, uh, we want to turn things over to Christy Davies. We appreciate having her here today to share her expertise with us. Christy, here you go. Hello everyone, I'm Christy Davies and I just noticed a little glitch um, that my non-financial, obviously I am an ASHA member, so I apologize for that and I can fix that. Um, again, I'm Christy Davies. I am a speech language pathologist and AAC consultant in the South Jersey, New Jersey area. Um, and now due to telepractice, we cover all of, all of New Jersey as well. And today I'm going to talk to you about tele-AAC evaluations specifically via online platforms. So um, just wanna say bear with me because I'm so used to reading body language and I'm so used to picking up on cues. So staring at my screen is gonna take me probably a couple slides before I get in my groove. Um, but the one thing that I can say with, with pure um, truities is that I find AAC evaluations beyond exciting. Uh, the idea of doing it about online, while it can be a scary, a scary thing, it's also an exciting venture, but in many different ways. When you realize the lives that we are impacting, you know, with our evaluations and the time with the family online, we feel the reward of getting so much more bang for your buck, if you can think of it that way. And so what I mean by that, um, and I don't mean to overgeneralize, but um, primarily the uh, evaluations that I, I do do currently are in the school setting. So we privately even, it's still more pediatric than adult, even though there are, you know, a small percentage of adults. So I am kind of overgeneralizing to that saying that when I get a call for evaluation in the school setting, the parent has a minimal participation, right? So due to the nature of the evaluation process in a school setting. So I'm not really here to debate that part of it, but what I mean really is that 
you know, there might be a possible parent interview or maybe a call, uh, maybe even a meeting. Um, obviously, best practice is to have that meeting. But the nine times out of 10, that parent's not physically in the evaluation room with you, right? Just like they wouldn't be for some other standardized um, speech language assessment. Typically, a parent might not be there. Um, or I should say, you know, very rare. So with that said, it's exciting to have the parent or support personnel front and center during the process um, with tele-AAC so they can see my wheels turn and what I like to refer to as Dr. Housing it. I'm not sure how many of you remember House, but that was one of my favorite TV shows back in the day, right? He was so beyond brilliant in his analysis of medical problems. So when I'm by myself in an evaluation, I keep all that analysis inside um, but when I'm doing tele-AAC evaluations, I have to share what I'm doing, when I'm doing it, and why I'm doing it. And these things are important so that support personnel, the parent, caregiver, whoever it is, um, they understand the, my process so they can do what I'm asking, when I'm asking, and how I'm asking it. Um, so the goal of the evaluation is the same, whether it be online or in person or a mix of both, some, some hybrid format is we wanna facilitate the most effective communication possible across a variety of environments and situations. I think that's clear, right? Doesn't matter for um, in a school, in a clinic, in a hospital, at a home, over the internet. It re that's that primary purpose and goal is still the same. The elements are not unique to tele-AAC. Um, first, again, understanding the client. Second, understanding AAC and its most updated evidence-based practices. And third, the information about the most updated devices and AAC systems. So uniquely, I won't go off on a tangent there, but I do like these elements. Um, I'd like to think about them because they're not always thoroughly understood or considered or perhaps even respected in that regard. Um, to know our client is to know their community, culture, family, outside of their strengths, their areas of need, the communication goals, et cetera. Um, and this is where tele-AAC can really kind of gleam and, and, and show all those things potentially more, and we'll get into that. Evidence-based practices is saying just that, right? We, we want to make sure that we are searching ASHA and other related sites for the most up-to-date research on um, AAC evaluations, and now more particularly AAC evaluations online, which is what we're here today to talk about. Uh, information about devices is always such a sticky situation in my eyes because so many of us are accidentally considering the individuals around the technology we have available to us compared to considering the technology out there to the client's profile and needs. So what I mean is many times I hear, well, I have an iPad, so I just bought a few apps or my district gave me uh, and the other SLPs and iPads. So we just had to let them know like an app or two to buy. And these apps are very expensive. And so these are the things I hear. So that clearly diminishes the concept of evidence-based practice and knowing all the client's needs and the information about the available AAC systems. Um, back in the day, not too far ago though, I even heard we have an old Vantage or Vantage light. So we use that referencing, they use that over an accent. Um, when really I, I just thought to myself, how could you assess that, right? The touch screens are so different. The processing speeds are so different. How could you get a clear picture of the client's abilities? Um, so to say the client, you know, fails or, or what have you, like how, who's to say that AAC is not appropriate? It's just to say that Advantage Lite is not appropriate. Um, and so that, our, our goals there. So a little, a little bit of a comparison in person versus tele-AAC. Some of it is obviously is stating the obvious, um, but to start an evaluation in person or online, obviously we're, or the beginning's the same, at least for me. You know, the request comes in, whether it be a referral, an insurance, a parent email, phone call, fax, a school district. And so therefore there's a need noticed or known, right? And so there's a fact finding process that occurs through observations, record review, interviews, surveys sent out, whatever that looks like, that, that fact finding, going through all that case history per se. The part that can be a little different between in-person versus tele-AAC is the observation can, um, can now have some differences that are known. So in person, obviously you're observing in real time. Perhaps you ask a question as to why you're observing what you're observing. Uh, you obviously try to be, you know, the fly on the wall during an observation, but there is that ability to 
quickly chime in and, and inquire for information. It's a brief segment of time. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're there for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, or to be honest with you, even two hours. It's still brief in the in the grander scheme, the broader scope. Um, and depending on your business or your evaluation model, you most likely only get one opportunity to observe. Uh, and again, it's just a little bit of the reality of it. In a perfect world, yeah, you would go out there a couple times because no one is ever the same in a, any same day. So with that said, you might not be privy to real-time observation outside of what you saw, meaning you know, dinner at home, something on the playground, watching TV, um, a certain lesson, uh, making it up. You know, you saw language arts over math, vice versa, science. If you're doing an evaluation in the clinic, you might not be privy to things at school or home that could be valuable information. So through tele-AAC, you can ask specifically for the parent to record two different scenarios or environments, and you can be the detective as to the communication available at that time um, and with those different skills or concerns that you're looking for. I go out of my way not to tell the family that I'm looking for times that are problematic as I don't want them to paint a picture in my head. Uh, most times families don't always necessarily understand what other areas are a concern or what a communication breakdown looks like. Um, what they think communication breakdown might look like is when it's like absolutely too late, but really there was all these other breakdowns that might have occurred. So taking videos to send for observation is a really great tool that tele AAC can really capitalize on. Not to say you can't do an observation via real time um, over, you know, a online platform with tele AAC, but it is sometimes more efficient just to get those videos and be more hybrid like in that. An in-person evaluation sometimes presents with uh, limiting schedule issues. Say you work potentially, you know, nine to three, eight to three, nine to four, whatever or geographic difficulties that also come into play with um, outpatient facilities, university clinics, schools, et cetera, where this, uh, whereas obviously sessions online allow for that freedom. Um, not to say our time is invaluable, but really it's to say that everybody values and respects their time differently, that perhaps you want to work extremely early in the morning or you want to work extremely late at night. Um, and that's the great thing to have that diversity is that families feel the same way, that life isn't cookie cutter in a nine to three box. Um, really, some of my best trainings did occur at 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night when myself plus the parent might have put our children to bed. And then we can get down to you know the nitty gritty and get some training done because um, we had no other divided attention. You know, everything that needed to be done was done. And that's really important and a really great thing about the tele AAC. Clinical concerns in person versus online for me are definitely a big difference. And what I mean by that, and it, maybe it's just me, um, but things are much easier to support in person than they are in line. But it's not to say we can't handle or support families with their technical um, challenges via tele AAC. It just might potentially hold a session momentarily or postpone it until the problem's resolved. So in person, clearly, you know, I go in there understanding any of the devices that I'm throwing in front of my student or client or whoever it is. Um, and that's the responsibility on me to make sure that I understand all the technical aspects of whatever it is that I'm evaluating. Um, and I can quickly modify, adapt, or, or fix a problem most times. Uh, if it's online, I have to try to coach somebody who does not have that same knowledge and skill set that I do. So it's not to say it can't happen. It just means obviously we're adding more time and therefore um, we need to wait for the problem to be fixed before we can get back to our evaluation process. And our cute, fun, loving little child or client might not want to wait during that. So that could be a little problematic per se with the tele AAC. Um, continuing with a couple hurdles, barriers with tele AAC. Um, because like I always tell everybody who knows me and for any of you who are on right now, I am a realist. So I, I do see the positive in things and I do see the negative and then I kind of look right down the, the line in the middle. Um, and so I, I include both positive and negative no matter what it is that I do. And so I understand that when, you know, you're thinking about tele AAC and evaluations, it's such a broad scope. 
right? We can talk about eye gaze, we can talk about switch access, we can talk about direct selection, we can talk about a variety, low tech, mid tech, high tech, uh, ASL. There is no one thing that makes AAC, um, and that's what makes it even more unique to consider our options via um, an online platform for AAC evaluations. So we're all aware, obviously, in-person evaluations are more optimal for a few reasons for those who have some more of the um, low incidence concerns. Um, so a few reasons like gross motor, gross motor, fine motor needs, uh, meaning possibly having like an OT or PT readily available um, that's obviously might not be a thing with tele-AAC or strategically will take a lot of collaboration to make that happen. Um, so those sort of supports in person or on the spot are much e easier. For me personally, uh, just like I mentioned jokingly when this started, observing demeanor, body language is much easier in person than on um, telepractice and tele-AAC. So it's, it's not to say it can't happen, but you might not get the whole picture, you know, with the camera angles and what have you. But when in a bind or when in COVID um, or geographic location situations that just don't support an a, a SLP with the knowledge in this area, it's important to know that one can fall back on tele-AAC. Clearly, an in-person evaluation decreases the stressors of HIPAA and other privacy concerns. You don't have to worry about a signed uh, business agreement, a BAA, or other sec secure online platforms. I think a lot of us sometimes forget about that piece of it, you know, knowing what kind of Wi-Fi secure setup that they have, you have, et cetera. Little nuances such as not worrying about who's in your background or like the phone that just went off in my background because I had an emergency and I'm no longer at my my own house. So, you know, you can't, you can't predict all the things that might happen. Um, so the people who might show up in your background or in their background who might accidentally hear or see something, why it might not seem like a big deal, you know, depending on where your four walls are or lack thereof, you know, those sort of stressors about privacy, you know, are there more so on tele than they are in person. And then clearly an in-person AAC evaluation allows for more of an in-the-moment findings. So what I mean by that is when you do your fact finding and you read all the reports and you understand in your mind, you understand the case history, you've even um, watched your videos of the observations, you know, a few different times just to make sure you caught every nuance. You did all that and yet you still might not know exactly all the pieces that you do. And so the easiest example obviously is, is something as simple as a key guard or something as simple as you're not changing the hardware but you're doing a little switch within the hardware, a, a software setting change or a, a user area change, something like that. Um, not to say that they can't happen with tele-AAC, but on the spot, you know, I can much, much more efficiently and very quickly change that if I'm in person. So some things you have to consider, again, is, is kind of, is client candidacy. And in normal AAC talk, I despise using the word candidate, and I think we can all agree on that. But when discussing telepractice, there's a time when we have to weigh the pros and cons if, if this is, is appropriate this sort of platform things to consider you know and um, those that's when some of these hurdles might come in um, and you can read some of the other ones here with our support personnel we have to think about the availability of the AAC systems how time-consuming tele AAC I mean AAC in general doing an appropriate uh, evaluation with evidence-based practice it, it can be very timely doing it via tele AAC as some methods I'll talk about soon, it could be even more, um, take even more time. So the support personnel, again, uh, I don't mean to offend, but I, I am an honest person. So the people who call on us, or maybe I shouldn't say me, so the people who call on me can also be the ones who might be part of the hurdle, and they don't mean to be. Um, and I mean that kindly. I also mean that they have a lot of things on their plate, right? Like, again, let's be realistic. And so they they might need some mental, emotional support, uh, ample education in this area. They might have tons of questions that might limit our time actually with the client. So therefore, that's where the time consuming part comes in. We might have to plan other sessions just with the support personnel and not with the client directly. 
obviously the financial bottom line comes into play when we're thinking about all that. And the tips and tricks that we're going to be um, asking of this support personnel, you know, we really just have to trust that, or they have to trust us that whatever it is that we're asking of them is, is for a reason. Um, and that we are, you know, doing or asking certain things uh, like don't prompt or prompt a certain way or, or please just wait. And when we're providing all these amazing tips, you know, like s'more and all the things, we're doing this for a reason. Um, they don't always want to read the research articles with you, right? So you can't go spamming their inbox full of these amazing um, articles. So sometimes that can be a little bit of a hurdle. Eye contact, and as we know, it's a big part of understanding a person as a whole, understanding the pragmatic abilities of a client. I'm not saying re eye contact is required, but it is, uh, eye contact does impact the sense of dig dignity of our client, and it, having it helps build that rapport and that trust. So depending on angles of our camera, we might have issues to ensure proper and appropriate eye contact higher levels of organization are obviously needed. We'll be talking a lot about that organization. Uh, and then again, the financials. There's there's a lot of uh, financial hurdles in my mind when it comes to tele-AAC due to some of the timely issues and some other things. Okay. One second, as we move on, let me just close out some things here. Okay, so I apologize if you're experiencing a lag. I'm not sure, I didn't say it outright, but we have a horrific storm that went through. And so I'm dealing with some pretty bad winds as we speak. Um, and just grateful that I have electric in the location that I am at. So if the lag continues, just let me know. Um, moving on to some considerations and that telecandidacy. Uh, you can see here sensory needs, physical abilities, endurance, cognitive, behavioral attention, motivation. Um, I want assurance uh, that they can see the monitor and hear the speakers. You know, those are obviously first and foremost. Um, when I'm listing these qualities and characteristics, I immediately think of Tracy Kovacs AAC profile. That's a great checklist and inventory to see these different communication competencies that will that were well researched in Jan Janice Light's 19 uh, late 80s work. Uh, I always go straight to those competencies when I'm looking at the overall picture of my clients. And of course, always remembering the social, cultural, and linguistic variables as well. Some of the individuals need proper amplification, perhaps some direct connection to an amplificated, excuse me, amplification device like a hearing aid, cochlear implant, what have you. So that's where it's important thinking of the technology that they're using. I have some families who are trying to use their phones. It's the only thing they might have available. Um, and so you just want to make sure that they're making the best choice of a technology to make to determine the most appropriate ahead of time, because that's really important so that they feel that they're getting the best experience with you when you are having your session. Other things, obviously, speech to text technology might um, be a great thing to have in place, closed captioning. And Google Chrome has some amazing extensions or Chromebooks in general to make this really easy for you. And I do this during my sessions um, just for that ability. For the visually impaired, we'll obviously we'll need the ability to enlarge images, the cursor size, print, text to speech, which is the opposite, obviously. Uh, output might be needed. So these are things you need to think about also with the device and or the SGD, whichever needs to have significant customization available, you know, with cell sizes and what have you. But their technology before even considering AAC needs to be ready and available for these needs, these sensory needs that they might have. 
So again, that's more organization on your end and the the pre the pre-session thoughts that need to be considered. The physical abilities and endurance um, are also very important. So I have some pictures here, you know, with with key guard, touch guard, without one. Um, and when shipping a device, I have to obviously take serious consideration of how I'm shipping a device to my clients, you know, with the key guard, without the key guard. And again, this is a little over generalized. We're specifically talking about a direct select. Um, I'm not mentioning my eye gaze or any of the other alternative access users right now. But what I find that might be easier is actually shipping it with the key guard on with whatever setup that I already de determined. And the reason I say that is because it's easier to take it off than it is to teach a family sometimes to put it on. And by the time they put it on, we might have lost the attention of our client and then have to instruct them, the caregiver, on how to not only install it, but then how to rein the client back in. So it's just something to consider, a little tip, tidbit right there is I use the key guard more often than not in the beginning of my evaluation session for a variety of reasons. And then I can always obviously pull it off and, and, and rein it back in without the need of that key guard. Um, but there's obviously uh, attention span concerns, movement breaks, sensory needs, all are tied in together. And so you have to have them planned ahead of time and you need to talk to the family to understand what their, their needs are so that, that you can be best prepared. Other things to think about, uh, the behavioral needs need to be addressed and discussed prior. So if the client who is most familiar or comfortable with using a choice board or a first end board, some other kind of token economy that needs to be discussed with the support personnel or parent or caregiver, whoever it is, the behavioral team even before just to ensure that you're ready. And it, it could be your version of it or potentially it even needs to be there. So that's a discussion that you need to have ahead of time because the session will not go well if those parameters are not in place and there are some online supports you know like a visual timer or things like that that you can have available during the session um, and not to make an evaluation session like a therapy session but in the same token we need to do what they're comfortable with and kind of familiar with within their routine if especially if tele aac is so new i like to try to find some sort of mechanism that feels like sameness to them. That feels like something that they're, they're comfortable and had experience doing um, in other platforms. The support personnel, staff, parent, whoever it is with you, they need to fully understand the role that they play in this process. So I'm sure some of us might have run into this just during um, the pandemic that we're in currently. So they need, what I mean by that is they need to understand direct, that they're directly involved. So they need to be off their phone. They need not to have distractions. They need to understand the plan. They need to be ready to document. And so that kind of makes them feel like, whoa, hold on. And they're like, I'm not, you know, I'm not the therapist. I'm not the teacher. Why am I documenting anything? Um, many times we find the support personnel consider themselves as like a, ba a babysitter even. A even when they truly are so grateful for the support and the help that you're providing them, they still kind of just feel like that person who needs to make sure that the computer doesn't turn off or that their child doesn't run away or something. But they need to understand their role is so much more important because um, ultimately they need to turnkey whatever it is that you're teaching or whatever it is that you're looking for. They need to turnkey that and support in generalization outside of the session. And that's why I mentioned before that you may need additional sessions um, specifically for training, both implementation sort of training and troubleshooting technology training. Uh, I make it very clear when I'm doing one or the other to say like, no, this is a technology based sort of training. You know, we can have a separate implementation training, you know, specific to whatever it is that I'm trying to target. And then obviously the support personnel is assisting with scheduling most times versus the client, him or herself. And we do need them kindly and gently, but to control any behaviors that might happen or to support in decreasing or eliminating any exterior things such as my phone ringing that might occur during your time together. 
The AAC selection and criteria. This one I think is is obviously the most important. And I feel that with tele-AAC, there's a little less wiggle room in my eyes because again, you're not physically there with your bag of tricks. So how many of you are like me and you get to the site no matter where it is, you know, in a home or in a clinic or you name it, school, and you pull out, you know, one or two huge bins that are on wheels, right? And you're lugging them along. Obviously, that's not occurring on the tele-AAC platform. So understanding this profile is crucially important to ensure that you're selecting the options that close fit this profile um, and doing your feature matching is, is just so crucially important. Uh, so when I'm considering these features, I tend to consider the attention, cog cognitive, behavioral needs, after obvious the overt things such as visual, gross, fine motor needs. And I believe strongly in motor planning. Uh, so therefore, I do consider my motor planning AAC systems uh, as one of the first and foremost features because even someone with good attention or no behavioral concerns, um, even some good cognit cognitive skills would still rather be more efficient in their communication and that motor planning philosophies, which I'm not gonna obviously talk and dive into completely, it's a separate webinar, can really support them with that. And I really, Think about all those things before I start making my selections, before I start contacting my, my companies that I work with, before I start mailing out devices or asking a company to mail out a device. Um, but with that, I, my philosophy is always the quicker someone can get their message out, the better, right? The quicker they find success, the more motivation they have, the easier this whole process will be. And so that's why I, I, I do lean to those systems with motor planning first. But we also have to always consider, you know, durability, lifespan, flexibility of the language system. Whatever language system you're looking at, it's not just about today and not just about August. It's it's about, and not even just about the 2020, 21 school year. It's, it's about the lifespan. Um, they say hardware is supposed to last approximately five years. Some, some insurances are beyond pleasant and they say three, but the reality is it's five years. So in a five-year period, I want to make sure that this client has enough language um, and linguistic capabilities within this system. And I have to think about that before I go sending them any device. Because if I send them something that isn't going to meet their needs in three and a half years, then, then why are we wasting our time? Um, so those are things that I consider. That is, So if I'm not in person, you know, and I have to contact a company and, and, and make those calls and make sure I get those systems available, or my own systems that I'm mailing out. These are all things I think about, including the warranties and tech support. Um, because when I'm not available, and I need to know that there's someone else that they can contact, you know, when there isn't a person such as myself, it doesn't need to mean me specifically, but if, if it was, you know, just a piece of technology they pulled off a shelf or they bought off a of Facebook marketplace, they're certainly not calling the previous owner, right? So I need to think about all these features and, um, qualities in my systems before I go and make that selection. So in the live interactive sessions um, in, in person and online, you getting the documentation reviewing like we talked about, you organize all that information, you select your video conferencing tool. So obviously here today we're using GoToWebinar I'm sure we're all very familiar with with this system because it's been out for quite some time with Zoom, Google Meet. So these are the things I was mentioning a few slides back when thinking about HIPAA and thinking about, you know, security compliance. You want to you have to think of which systems provide that for you. I know a lot of families just say like, oh, can we Skype or can we FaceTime? Um, you need to be very careful with that. And those are things I think about. But more importantly, when thinking of the video conferencing tool, I uh, think about the features that that tool itself is going to provide me, which we'll talk about in a couple slides. I then go and schedule it. And I know that sounds silly, like of course you schedule it. But when you schedule it, you really wanna maybe schedule out a few sessions. Block yourself all the time, because you can always take it back out of your schedule, but know that these are gonna take you more time than you will ever be able to predict. So schedule it. You don't might not even have to tell them all the sessions you schedule, but just go ahead and schedule it. Um, 
myself, the way that I've been finding it works best, and everybody's a little different, um, but I really like to do things myself. So after I decide which equipment I feel that I would like to use, and, it, I, and I am not using my own library that I have, which I know is atypical, I know a lot of clinicians don't have their own library of systems, then I would contact the company and I have them ship the device to me. I don't want to put it on the families to program the device. I think that adds such an extra layer of stress. So after I get the system, I program it and I immediately send it out to the family. Again, understanding when my scheduled time is. So I need a, a lot, a lot of time bef between. So I have that shipped to me, I ship it to them. I even, depending on which company it is, you know, and they're gracious enough to give me a return label, I keep that in the box. I explain to the parents they're gonna ship it back, not me, uh, most times. And it works really well. I do that pre-teaching that I talked about. So before I even get online with, with um, my client, I do that pre-teaching. I uh, make sure we, we have our valuation, we have our time together. I have on any sort of data collection that's available within that language system, within that um, AAC system, LAM, language ac activity monitoring. I'll, I'm sure you guys are familiar with LAM and then obviously realized language and all the things. I have that on and ready. Obviously, I talk to the parents about it. And then I do these steps with another system. So after I have my session and we, we do the things, obviously, I still need to do what I would do in, in, in person. I need to evaluate more than one system. And, and I do just that. Um, but within this process, I still make sure that all the other things, such as the, the monitors and, and uh, the third technology, that everything is charged and ready, and that's part of that whole pre-teach support part. The great thing about tele-AAC is that it, the AAC evaluation can be completely live and interactive, which would be obviously you and me right now, you know, our face is showing and, and we're having a session. Obviously, a lot of us at this point are familiar with teletherapy because of thank you to the past, you know, three, four months of our life. Um, with that, there's also that store and forward concept, which means a little bit even like I mentioned with our observations that are recorded, is that we can tell them what to do for evaluation per se. Try to do this, mom. Try to model, eat. Try to teach this concept, eat and drink. Do it at the mealtime. Set this, you know, camera pod that I, that I put in the box with my device and put it on your dining room table and hit record. And then put it up in the cloud and email it back to me you know, um, or a mix of both. So you can have a little hybrid there of the live and interactive sessions with a little store and store and forward concept. And I do love it when families send me, I actually just got one right before this session. I do love it when families are sending me videos of their little ones during our AAC trial times or any times, you know, just let you know, great, all this hard work that we're all putting forth is really paying off. So, I, I'm not going to harp just for the sake of time, but I really go out of my way to be even more organized on my tele-AAC sessions than I do in person because you need to understand all the pieces because if you miss the piece, then the session can go really bad. So I really break down my session down to the greeting even. Um, it, how am I going to introduce a session? What, I, what activity or intervention am I going to do? How am I going to, what kind of data am I collecting? How am I going to wrap up the session? And I talk about my role. I explain to the uh, support personnel what their role is with this, uh, which hardware softwares are needed, uh, and any sort of arrangement within their environment is needed so that they know ahead of time, like, make sure you have this available and out, make sure you have this this book or this toy, make sure you put it away, you know, at this time. So I have more of their attention possibly. And so I, I make sure I have that completely organized and I might even send it to them. So they're, they say as well. The technology, like I mentioned, uh, Zoom, Google Meets, uh, the GoTo uh, meeting, the various ones, I think about them. I tend to personally go for Zoom. I'm a big fan of it. Um, and I don't have such a positive relationship with Google Meets, um, but that's just my preference. And obviously everybody's very different and unique in that, and that's okay. Uh, with that said, obviously due to the privacy breach that occurred a few months ago, some school districts around me have banned uh, Zoom, even though obviously they did update. 
but I, I need certain features. And that's mo most important for me to, to be successful and not just me feel successful, but the family feels successful. I need screen sharing capabilities. That's really important. Document sharing. They're features similar to traditional teletherapy that you guys are obviously getting comfortable with these past few months. Um, but I, they, I need them even more so available so that I can screen share my device. Controlled mouse support is really great, you know, for when you're doing some sort of interactive activity or game. Or even if you want them to activate an area or, or an icon, if you're using like new voice pass software, you know, having them be able to do that, if that's an option, you know, with their uh, dexterity and fine motor. The whiteboard is great for typing and drawing and, and describing things, both a mixture of text and drawing there for the support personnel and for the client. Instant messaging and the chatting capability within the system, such as this one, which you guys are all doing now when you have questions, it's going to, um, you know, those who are organizing this event right now. Uh, having that so you can guide the support personnel during the session without being so interruptive. The document camera, I see these questions all the time on Facebook, having a great document camera or just uh, an extra iPhone or an extra iPad using the AirPlay. I turn on the camera there and next thing you know, I can show my accent and parents think that's just like the, the best thing since sliced bread. And they, you know, they love that. I can teach them how to quickly do that themselves. So now they're showing me their accent if we're doing something technologically based um, and it's quick. So those are really in, important things to think about where the camera is, what kind of capability the camera has, making sure they understand where their camera physically is placed. So we get the best picture of um, our client's gaze and our, our client's abilities when accessing whatever system we're talking about. Making sure the camera's not panned out too far, making sure it's not too close. Those are um, all pieces of the technology that I think about. And I really just like one system. And I really feel personally that, that Zoom gives it to me, but not to say other systems don't, it's just a level of comfort specifically. For the evaluation, I'm not gonna turn it into a therapy session, but obviously a lot of the things that you guys are familiar with for therapy work during the evaluation. I want first and foremost, the same thing I want in person. I want to get their motivation. I wanna pique their interest. And from there, I wanna see their skill set on the things that I'm looking for. It's not, you know, I need to still look at all levels of AAC competency, you know, them operating and navigating pages per se, or them going from one icon to two icons, them understanding icon sequencing, whatever it might be, I'm still looking for the same things via tele-AAC as I would in person. Uh, in person, I might obviously not be using websites, I'd be using maybe more toy-based things, but you can be creative and you can use your own materials. You can ask the family for their materials, ask the family to email you photos, or they can share their photos on their own screen so that you, you can talk about things that they firsthand experienced. Um, and you can implement that right into, incorporate that right into your evaluation and things clearly that are motivating for them to want to talk about, they'd be more interested and they're gonna stay with you um, for a longer period. I know I mentioned that the pre-training, ongoing training for our uh, support personnel, our caregivers is, is really, really important. Um, unfortunately, this does come down to time and this does come down to financials for some, and I do understand and respect that, but I, I can't harp enough on that training piece. Uh, creating videos ahead of time to support some of the things you're talking about is really important. So have it kind of as a little pool or a little library that you can go back to and say, oh, I was talking about this. Let me send you a video of what a good example of what that meant, whether it be, you know, wait time or whether it be um, teaching them not to start to navigate to something for the their child or their, their, um, their client on the other side. You know, you, some of the things that you don't realize you need to teach because we could physically show those are the things you wanna make sure you take a video of so that you can easily just send that to them or show it via your screen share. Uh, you wanna be creative with your 
your teletherapy tactics, obviously, you want to go over some of that data stuff together. If they really feel like they're a team member and they can see the result of the things they are or are not doing, then they're going to be more invested um, and they're going to be able to um, be in it to win it and stay sustained for all those other sessions that are needed. So whatever the activities that we're doing during those sessions to assess the different AAC system, we need to do it again. After we go through the evaluation with one tool, we're going to need to have a time period on that potentially and then mail out another system or have it already available depending on how many devices you ship the first time. So when we do these activities and these things with the other system, then we can objectively document, you know, access abilities, visual attention, physical attention, motor abilities, endurance, et cetera. And that's super critical. Just like you would in person, you'll want to organize some charts and let people see your intentions. Show them what your plan of attack is and with what words and how you're going to use them. Give them concrete examples and that will help them along the way. And it helps just take the pressure off of them when they can understand where you're going and where your thought process is. More so, it also helps you be objective and so you can document better when you're comparing devices A and B. If you were looking at this circumstance or this activity, try to look at that activity with the other device. So if you're looking at this word, how are they able to access this phrase on the one device? Um, remember that because you're, you're going to want to try to do that with the other one, you know, if at all possible. Implementation plan is another document that I, I like to share with the, with the support personnel. And remembering that AAC is fluid and that there's not one system that's always best. So you can still incorporate if they're using sign language or if they're using other sort of modalities or means. It doesn't need to be a speech generating device, but you do need to remember to be explicit because families are going to ask, well, can they sign over using it or, or do they have to use the the um, the SGD, things like that. So if you gave examples where it could be okay versus another time where we want to encourage something with voice output, um, whatever it is, you just, you want to have it spelled out. And it also gives the family time when they see this and later they can probe and trial the systems that you, you feel are working. So most importantly is what I find is treating this tele-AAC session almost like a fun quest. I'm not sure if that's the right word. Um, I do what I do in person. I have the same thought process. I don't let the technology be overwhelming. I think a lot of the hurdle has been technology and as we are getting more familiar and that has nothing to do with our, our normal evaluation process and, and who we are as evaluators. That's a separate thing that you can spend different time to go and make sure you get a webinar specific to the, the platform that you feel comfortable with or that you're allowed to use. I think it's most important also to, to build these relationships with these companies such as PRC Sotella. They're doing a great job with their family discovery program with loaning out devices. They've been completely okay with shipping them directly to me versus to my families, understanding that it is for different families that I have so that I can go ahead and program it. Um, and I do different, different user areas, you know, and I, I program my vocab builder or I program whatever is needed, hide show, I do it all ahead of time, but I have a plan. So once A is working and I wanna excel to next, I already know what that is. So if A is not working, I know I can go to B and whatever that looks like. Um, and I, and again, it, making sure that everybody has the patience to know that once this system A is finished, I will be moving on to system B. And that's just really important. Implementation obviously also includes the strategies and that's the, the biggest teaching part because I always tell my families, don't worry about the technology. Let me, let me be the person who's gonna support you with that technology or, or use tech support you know, and, all, and all the other people. You most importantly is you need to understand how to support the communication of your significant other of your child, the student. 
and teaching them the, the modeling and and whatever prompting strategies or hierarchies you're going to use and when they're appropriate and who needs to do them. And since it's tele AAC, is I can say, hey, like, can we have a session, please, where him his sister is available and she can sit with us. This doesn't have to be just on the support personnel, i.e. the parent. This can be on on a larger scope. You know, I have individuals who obviously have 24 hour nursing. Um, if, if they're all on board and with permissions, there's no reason why I can't pull in the nurse. She's with her potentially more than any other person, right? Uh, and that's really important to make sure that we're, we're understanding who all those players are and that they all feel comfortable because this isn't on any one person. And then in the comments, when I'm able to email this ahead of time to my families, they can write their questions in there or they can give me examples um, when it actually did work out. And so it's great to see that. Okay, so we are winding down here. Anybody have any questions for any of that information? Yes, we have a handful of questions for you, Christy. I'm gonna. Sure. And again, I sincerely apologize for the phone. It's not my house, and I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> no problem. Um, one of the questions that came up was, could you um, tell us what the LAM stands for again? Language activity monitoring. So most devices this day and age have some sort of data logging. Language activity monitoring, LAM, uh, built into the system. So, for example, when I'm when I'm using the Touch Chat Express with um, Word Power, when I'm using the the Prio Lamp Words for Life, or the Accent with Unity or Lamp Words for Life on the Accent, I turn on the LAM, the data logging so that I can go and retrieve that information either from the cloud on realized language or with, you know, with the flash drive, whatever it is, depending on which system it is. And it's not just specific to those. There are other systems that have other versions of activity, language activity monitoring or data logging. Um, and I just find that that's really important because you can see the times it is used. And if you're focusing on, again, in the beginning, I look for immediate mastery. So therefore, if we're looking specifically for just the handful of words that we were targeting, I can see all of that on my LAM. And so I can say, great job, kudos mom and dad, or whoever I'm talking to, like you really rocked it. I can see when I'm looking at these files that you, you know it was used so much, whether it be through modeling, prompting, or them, you know, the, the client themselves accessing it. Um, that's that's its purpose and so i can look through that and we use that as a teaching tool during the evaluation process and also as a way to prove that this device works or doesn't work because this ultimately comes down to the same evaluation report document that insurances are looking for so this the lam just gives it more uh in-depth uh description as to the success of the trials perfect and then a couple people had asked um about if you were positioning your camera to see what they're directly selecting versus um, using just what you're seeing of them. And have you found a best preference on that during the evaluation? Sometimes um, for the quick and easy, because again, I, I, have, I do outweigh the pros and cons of how much stress I'm asking of my uh, support personnel. <laughs> Uh, I think that does come into play, you know, when we're thinking of intrinsic and uh, extrinsic barriers. Uh, the extrinsic would obviously be, be the environment and the people in which you are supporting our client. If they can handle it, then I will ask them sometimes to have a camera back there um, with obviously the, the system, the laptop or computer system that we're using that already has a different camera as well. Um, sometimes you just have to take the, the parent's word of what they're accessing as well, if they could, parents sometimes records things during our session on their end, because you can see things from a different light, because it's not just about their hand or their finger, but sometimes I realize later that he got antsy after I requested this of him, X, you know, and so I wouldn't necessarily be paying attention to that at, at some given moment. And so being able to come back to that 
and having that recorded, uh, I mentioned, you know, kind of store and forward concept. So even though they're with me during the session, there still might be a, a recorded session going on on their end. And then I can get that later. And that is helpful too. So it depends on the client and depends on the technological savviness that I can teach to the support personnel. But most times it just tends to be directly from the screen. Perfect. And there are quite a few questions that we won't be able to get to. And so we just wanted to let everyone know um, that we'll pass the questions on to Christy and she can respond to them um, as she's able. Um, but one that did kind of pop up quite a bit, um, and I know state by state might be a little different, uh, but maybe talking a little bit about um, going from your evaluation with a device that you sent out in the trial, how long are you doing in between um, those different device trials uh, with the evaluation? Um, no, yeah, there are definitely different requirements. I think that is state by state or even sometimes insurance by insurance. Mm -hmm. But um, what just happened to us last month, we had a, uh, an individual, we sent out a device and um, they were dead set against it. So there's no reason in the world that I would obviously wait my, my the four weeks that I allotted in my calendar after going through a couple sessions and, and encouraging parent and, and providing different tips and techniques, I'm not going to make that client keep trying for that four week period. So I'm not sure if that's making sense or that's just being pretty specific to, to one scenario. Um, but I do like to give them uh, ample opportunity. So we do tend to give a four week during this tele AAC right now, we were giving them a few weeks because it takes so much time on our end and the parents end to under the parents end to understand our end to teach what we're looking to get out of the sessions. So if it's an immediate adverse reaction for whatever reason, clearly I again I go back to always wanting independence, mastery, motivation first and foremost. So I'm going to potentially just put a kibosh on that one and move on. But overall, I would I would give them three to four weeks on on a system if all the training is going well, you know, our sessions are going well, both with the client and the, the parent before I move to the next one. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christy, for this great presentation. As we mentioned, um, there are still quite a few questions that we weren't able to get to um, and we'll pass them along to Christy and she can respond as time permits. Uh, we want to thank all you, our participants for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our guest webinar and look forward to seeing you for future webinars. The recording for the webinar will be on the PRC brand YouTube channel, as well as our Saltillo and Touch Chat YouTube channels in a couple of days. Um, please remember there will be a survey that pops up as you leave the webinar. We would love your feedback um, and let us know about other webinars you'd be interested in. And then you have 15 days to send us your completed ASHA forms to receive the um, CEUs for ASHA registry. And you will get a certificate of attendance um, in the email that will follow. Give us about 24 hours um, to get that email out to you. And if you have not received it in a day or so, then you are able to uh, reach out to us at info at um, to ask about that. So thank you again, Christy, and thank you for everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, thank you. Take care.